Theatreland, London's West End. One square mile of musical talent worth over a quarter of a billion pounds a year. One of the cultural epicenters of Great Britain and the world. But it wasn't always this way. 65 years ago, the West End was parochial, trapped in a time warp of pre-war nostalgia, completely unprepared for a new breed of musical emerging from America. This is the story of the rise of the British musical. How the British fought back against American domination to not only reclaim the West End, but to become a driving force behind musical theatre around the world, turning it into a global industry worth over one and a half billion pounds a year. It's a tale of titanic shows. Half of it wasn't written, and the bits that had been written were far too long. Nobody in our team had done it before, except for me. This was a sort of a musical phenomena. A story of prodigious talent. All the talent that was being invented were all in Britain. We just thought, this is working quite well. And that was the day my life changed forever. And phenomenal daring. After the reviews, our box office was, was shredded. They got to see some ass. They took him off screaming. We never saw him again. That's how difficult that show is. At the end of World War II, the West End musical, cut off from outside influences for six long years, was looking tired. The musicals of one-time giants Ivan Novello and Noel Coward, with their polite tales of romance, were feeling as out of date as their Victorian settings. And in 1947, London found itself under a new bombardment, a wave of American musicals, quite different from anything any British audience had ever seen before. I remember when Oklahoma came over, it, it had a terrific effect on us. The home up where the wind comes sweeping down the plain. I was just knocked out, absolutely knocked out, breathless. When the wind comes right behind the rain. It was just wallop on, you know, Oklahoma, and you, wow, and the, and the energy of it sort of took your breath away. It was the first time after the sort of dreary years of what was going on in the war where a, a, a vibrant new musical had opened in London and it was a burst of sunshine. In its choreography, lighting, even its cowboy setting, Oklahoma was light years away from what the British were doing. But its most revolutionary aspect was the way it seamlessly stitched dance, song and dialogue into a dramatic whole. The dances and the songs were all part of the show, which was unusual. In the, in the old days, the songs just came in for no reason at all. But they were, it was all a, a whole, you know, integrated. The Americans had arrived. Powerhouses like Rogers and Hammerstein, Irving Berlin and Lerner and Lowe. The Americans had so many great writers in full swing. They just came one after the other, you know. It was marvellous. The Americans were in the ascendance. With things, the British musical seemed to be finding its feet. But the Americans had already unleashed yet another game-changing blockbuster. Overriding the whole of the musical theatre from the late 50s to the early 60s was West Side Story, which was just such an overpowering achievement. Everybody just watched it with open mouths and said, how the hell do you do that? West Side Story's update of Romeo and Juliet using rival ethnic street gangs left audiences shocked. 
never before had a musical attempted such adult themes and tied it together with a bristling soundtrack and electrifying choreography. And no one knew what to do. The musical had come to a stop, killed by genius. Bernstein's genius stopped them knowing where they were going to go next. So along comes Lionel Bart, an ordinary cockney boy from the East End, mid salt beef and a pickle, and he goes back to his cockney roots. What Lionel did, instead of trying to leap over the bar, he limboed under it and came in with this Dickens story that had British tunes in it. He didn't try and do that American jazzy stuff to equal West Side Story. He did these knees up, ah, uh, you know, you, you cannot listen to Oliver without doing that. Can't sit yourself. <laughs> Like Bernstein, Bart had written a musical about street gangs, but this was a very British story set in the seedy underbelly of Dickens' London. When I see someone rich, both my thumbs start to itch, only to find some peace of mind, I have to pick a pocket or two, you got to pick a pocket or two. Even with the brilliance of Moody as Fagin, at its stage premiere in June 1960, Bart wasn't convinced that Oliver could be a success. Lionel Bart was so convinced that it was a flop that he went down the road to, to um, Barbara Windsor's dressing room, uh, where he spent most of the show because Things Ain't What They Used To Be was on there, and came back and heard this braying noise and thought he was being booed. Donald Aubrey, who was the producer, was, Where the hell have you been? Come with me. And they basically pushed him on stage. By this time, they'd taken 23 curtain calls, not just curtain calls, but reprises of Consider Yourself. They'd sung that song 23 times. The cast were hoarse. The audience wasn't going to go home. And Wolf, that was it. He was the master, suddenly. It wasn't just Lana Bart anymore, it was a big thing.